I have the pleasure also of announcing Amadi Abdelaziz. He will be our next speaker, so uh, bear with him for the next uh, session. Uh, Amadi is Oracle expert and Google champion. He also is international speaker and trainer. So Amadi, I will give the stage to you now. Of course, like last time, the Q&A session will be held outside on the Hip Space booth. Thanks. Thanks, Nino. All right, so let's get uh, going. Are you still awake or uh, more coffee is needed? Still awake? Asleep? Okay, let's, let's get to introduce each other, like let's get to know each other. Uh, how many of you are actually a web developer? Okay, awesome. So this is excellent for you. But uh, those who didn't raise their hand, are they like mobile developer or business people? Anyone from business, marketing, sales? No one? Or I cannot see. Okay. So uh, my name is Mahdi. I work for Vaden as a developer advocate. And uh, as Nino said, I am also a Google developer expert and Oracle developer champion. Um, and because I'm going to have to run very, very quickly after this session, so please uh, hit me on Twitter if you want to continue the discussion or just get out of your comfort zone and just ask me a question like immediately if you feel like asking me something. Uh, so let's get uh, started. Uh, so going web native. For those of you, the web developer, the hardcore web developers, you know this, what I'm talking about, that uh, we noticed a huge rise of uh, front-end frameworks. It feels like every second day, we see a new fr front-end framework appearing in the market. And the big hustle is uh, we no longer know which framework to pick. Should I just pick one framework and focus on it for the whole year? And then after one year, I figured out that this framework is no longer available and I spent the whole year, I wasted the whole year for no reason. Or should I just uh, learn one framework per week? And then after the end of the year, it's gonna be 54 frameworks. Of course, both of them are not like really uh, good ideas. And also the Wired magazine uh, on 2010 announced that the web is actually dead. And they, they didn't come up with this just out of their heads. It, it, it has a reason. This guy went on stage a few years before and announced this little device with a lot of apps. And everyone got the feeling that the future is all about native applications, which was true. What we see now is most of the focus of businesses is developing a native application for smartphones. If you want to succeed and if you want to reach better segment of your businesses, of your customers, then it's best to, to target them through smartphones. And to target them through smartphones, one of the good ideas is to develop fully fledged, high performing mobile app. But there is, there is something that has changed recently. So if we compare the number of uh, visitors to a native app versus a web app, we will find that it's very small. Actually, the visit to web application is three times more. And the reason behind that, you can think about it. So now I'm a visitor here in Belgrade, and let's assume, well, I'm a geek, right? I want to eat pizza. So what, what should I do? Should I go to Play Store and search pizza in Belgrade? Or will I go to a search engine like Google or, or Bing or something like that and search for pizza in Belgrade? Most likely, I'm gonna, find, I'm gonna go to a search engine. And then, if you have a good website that has a good user experience and good search engine options, then the likelihood of your website to be picked is way higher than having a mobile app. So regardless of you, if you develop the mobile app with the highest technology, Swift, Assembly, even C++, Kotlin, all these technologies, it doesn't matter for the normal user. The normal user will most likely find you first through web. And it's up to you and your expertise to know how can you catch your user and acquire the user once they visit your web page. Do you want to direct them and tell them, hey, uh, cut the part of the page and telling them that I have a native application, go to the Play Store and download it? Or do you want to acquire your user and provide a good responsive UI that eventually make your user a customer. But there is another statistic. It says that it's most likely that people are gonna stay more on native 
applications. So even though the reach on web application is higher, but people don't stay too much on web application. People prefer to go to native application and spend most of their time there. So what's going on here? I'm, I'm kind of like contradicting myself all the time. I keep telling you like native apps is best, no web apps is best. The problem with web is that expectations. Web was never built to be a modern thing that works on smartphones. Let's face it, web is an HTTP protocol, hypertext transfer protocol. It was built many decades ago to be just uh, a bunch of links and a bunch of text. You click on a link, it opens um, another page. It was never designed to work offline. It was never even intended to work on smartphones. So probably this is the reason. And before I continue, I'll love to tell you a little bit story about myself. So uh, a few time ago, I was traveling to this uh, planet called America. I went to uh, Austin. And they have a pretty nice uh, airport. When I went there to the airport, uh, the European side inside me felt like, I don't want to uh, use taxi or anything like that. I want to actually, because I'm a technical guy, I want to use technology to reach my hotel. So, and also I don't want to like, make a currency conversion and go to like, uh, a place to change money and all these kind of things. So I searched online. Luckily, there was a internet, good internet connection in the airport. I searched online and found this uh, nice app. It was a recommended app to use because if I download this app and I install it, I'll be able to purchase using my credit card. And then it's just a matter of showing my ticket in the bus ticket to let me in. At that time, uh, it was 5.23 PM. And buses are coming every 30 minutes. So 5.30, 6, 6.30, and so on. So I have seven minutes. And if you think about it, in seven minutes, you can do plenty of things. A lot of things that you might be uh, able to do in seven minutes. So definitely, I should be able to buy a bus ticket in seven minutes. So let's get started. I basically started to download the app. And well, the internet was good, but not good enough to download an app. Even though the app is 18 megabyte only, you see that the download speed wasn't that high. And here, when I say 80 megabyte, it might sound to most of you that it's a small number. What is 80 megabyte? We now are talking about gigabytes and like big space and all these kind of things. Now, let me put it that way. If I tell you, go to mywebsite.com, and before you get to see anything on my website, you will have to wait for 80 megabyte to be downloaded first. Will you still consider that my website is optimized? Think about it. So I had to wait 18 megabyte, and I, of course, I had to like, accept whatever permissions it asks me. And also, I had to wait for the installation. And when it installs, it takes a little bit bigger space. But that was fine. Then it asked me for uh, signing up. And because I know that the experience of filling the form on a mobile phone, entering my first name, last name, address, confirm address, email, confirm email, password, confirm password, sign up, go to the email, confirm email. I know that it's a hassle. So I thought, oh, well, those guys are smart. They provided me with sign-in with Facebook and formerly Google+. So I thought maybe, yeah, I can give it a try, sign up with Facebook. And unfortunately, because I don't use Facebook here on my mobile phone at all, I was greeted by this page that asked me to enter my first name, my, my email and password. And I do not know my Facebook password. It's not something that I know by heart. I know that if I open it from a browser, it's saved there, and I, I just can log in. So I had to flip around myself to figure out what is the password of my Facebook. And then after I copied it here, it asked me for two-step verifications, and it, it was a little bit of an experience. But that was fine, because later on, it asked me again to enter credit card information. That's 16 digits that you have to hold the credit card and, and then the phone like that and copy them one by one, enter the expiration date, validate, and wondering about the security of the system and all these kind of things. Well, you might wonder that seven minutes later, what was the expected time to buy a bus ticket, I finished at 6.01. You know what that means? It means that I didn't only miss one bus, I missed two buses. It means that I had to leave the airport at 6.30. So I, in total, I wasted one hour and seven minutes just because I wanted to use technology. And here I'm not complaining about the bus system in Austin. The bus system is quite advanced. 
Think about it. If this bus system is here in your home country, and it tells you, download this app once in your lifetime, and sign up and have your credit card information once in your lifetime, and then it's going to automatically take some uh, credit, go to the bus, and tap to uh, get into the bus, and all these kind of things. That's, that's a very good thing. So native applications are needed, and native applications are not going to go anywhere. It just depends on who is the target, uh, target audience. For me, I was the wrong audience for this app. For a local person who lives in Austin, probably it's for them. To continue the story, when I uh, reached the hotel, they told me uh, that I have this nice mobile app that uh, let me to open the door by just tapping. Like, I don't need to have a key or anything. I just tap and it opens. And they told me it gives you rewards and notification and receipt and points and a lot of nice features. The technical guy inside me told them, well, you know, I'm too tired. I'm not a technical person. Don't you have these plastic keys that you just push it here and it works? That was after a big frustration of what I have seen at the airport. I was, I was completely like tired and I decided that I'm not gonna go with technology anymore, at least for that day. And now you can think about it all around yourself. Think about the amount of native applications that you have in your mobile device that you actually don't need. Or you might be needing, but you don't need them to be native. I'm thinking myself about Facebook. Why do I need a, a native Facebook? Why, if, if I really need to access Facebook, why I cannot just open it from the browser whenever I need? If you think about LinkedIn, if you think about many famous applications that you probably are using, but you are not using constantly, you are using just seldom once, once per week or per month. Think about the food app, food app, think about a lot of businesses, and you as a developer, when you are targeting businesses, think about all those kind of possibilities about the apps that might not really need to be developed natively, at least for the first. So, statistics shows that the number of apps is told per month, like, think again about yourself. If you think about the last month, how many apps you have installed. And here I'm not talking about uh, if you have just bought a new mobile phone, because that means that you spend two days installing 300 apps to saturate yourself. But here I'm talking about after that. If you have a mobile app that is old enough, and then you feel that at the beginning you, you are installing a lot of apps, and then you, you reach a level of saturation. And then after that, most likely, you don't install any app except by a recommendation. Like someone tell you, an app for this conference, then you download it. Or an app that lets you do some magic, then you download it, and so on. Actually, statistics says that we have only zero apps installed per month on average. Cast it on yourself. So it seems that businesses no longer, it seems that businesses no longer gonna invest in native apps anymore. It seems that, according to statistics, 20% of the big companies are going to abandon their native investment and focus on the web. And here I'm not saying that, again, I'm not saying that native applications are disappearing. The focus on native application has now an alternative. And you can cast this on a good experiment that we had in the history. If uh, you go back in time and think about desktops. So at the beginning, we had these desktops. And whenever you want an app, you download the setup.exe or install.exe or .deb if you are using Linux. And then you install it. And then after some time, you get the updates and update and so on. And then the cloud has appeared. And this cloud kind of killed the concept of native application. Cloud plus high performing browser with a lot of capabilities and a lot of features made us nowadays, whenever we think about any app, any kind of app, even if it's maps navigation, even if it's 3D processing, you can take a look at AutoCAD. AutoCAD is now on, on web. Even if it's YouTube, video watching, all these kind of apps, we no longer rely on native apps anymore. We go to the browser. And this is slowly moving to the mobile as well, except that the biggest things that we want to solve on the smartphones right now is the friction. This is copied from uh, XKCD. Basically, if you uh, think about this new mobile 
smartphone that you buy and think, why it doesn't just come with all the apps pre-installed? And the answer is called the web. So can we actually bake our own cake and eat it? Think about the fragmentation of the devices that you need to target nowadays. It's just not easy anymore to learn all the kind of frameworks and APIs of the IoT connected devices and learn every single platform separately. You need to think about something that is, can, can help you move easier. And turns out the web was not slacking off. Actually, the Wired magazine, two, day, two years ago, they announced that it turns out the web is not dead after all, as they announced. Because big companies sat together and they created the so-called web manifesto. It's basically an agreement to solve the problems that we have seen in the web. The web was created many decades ago, 20 or 30 years ago, but now we need to renovate the web. We need to build it, rebuild the web to make it match our needs nowadays. And four main issues that I'd love to highlight today, which is the lack of component model, the lack of application model, the performance, and the hardware access. And those issues, I'm highlighting them because those are the, the barrier that makes a difference between a web application running on, onto your web browser and a native application. So let's get started. The first, uh, the first issue, application model. So uh, what you see on the screen right now is actually a bunch of components uh, developed by Vaden. And now the biggest question that you're going to ask, how can I use those components? Are they developed for Angular or for React or for jQuery maybe? The problem with components model is very old. A lot of initiatives have appeared to try to make these huge fledged components that you can just take it a toolkit of all components and you can use it inside your application. And this problem is extended till nowadays. So those are new frameworks that are still facing the same issue. So now you learn React and you start to develop for your customer with React and you develop uh, components and everything. And next, after one year, your customer tell you, or a new customer comes and tell you that they want Angular. Now you need to learn Angular and you need to rewrite all your components to match Angular. Not to mention about the debug issue and hassles that we see in the browser. Now, web components. So what you see on the screen is how I write a web component, Vaden did Picker, for example. And it's one line of HTML code that gets rendered as a fully fledged component. So this is one line that operates everything. Now, can you see what is the highlights here? The highlights here is that it's an HTML tag. So basically any framework, any framework will be able to use it. This is not, not something that is related to Vaden or we didn't invent it. That's the big companies that came up with and we're just following it inventing the web components, a standard way of writing a component that can be interoperable. You can use it with Angular, React, or any framework on Earth that supports HTML. I'd like to uh, like cast this to a famous question. Like, uh, people ask, so, so uh, like, what if my browser or framework doesn't support it? If, if I have a, uh, a browser that, for example, doesn't render HTML, can we call it a browser? Like I go and install something, it's called the future browser. But then after I install it and I try to open google.com, it tells me, sorry, I cannot render HTML. Can we consider it a browser? No. So nowadays, if a browser does not understand web components or a framework that doesn't understand web components, we can no longer call them a front end framework and we can no longer call them browsers. Why? Because it's a standard. If, if a frame, front end framework doesn't understand HTML, it's the same issue as if a framework doesn't understand web components. Now, because I don't have much time, I'm just gonna go very quickly showing you how I created this component. It's not a magic or very complicated things. It's just a very simple JavaScript class that extends HTML element uh, and then defining it this way. So you define it so that it can be used anywhere around your page with my dash component. So now with the tags that you can use is my, my dash component. And this is uh, an example on how to render it in the 
Shadow DOM. And this is the final output. So this is a script. And you can see that the line down there is my dash component. And here, you see that this component is basically just one line. Of course, in my debug tool, I can see the, the inside of this component that's called the shadow root. But you can turn this off, and basically, your tree will be way simpler. So that's for web components. Now to the second issue, which is the lack of application model. How can you develop something and introduce it and ship it to the customer in terms of one known product? So um, if you ever have been a, a mobile developer, for example, or any kind of other thing other than web, and I ask you this question, how to develop, for example, uh, an Android application? The answer will be known. Everyone know. I go to Android Studio, new project. And then it creates the skeleton and everything is known. Same for iOS, same for Windows application, same for like all the applications model are just standardized. But for the web, if I ask you as a web developer how to create a new web application, what is your answer? The first question you're going to ask me back, what is your language? If it's PHP Cake, then you have the framework called Cake that creates an application with this structure. But if you are using Java, then it depends on what is the framework that you are using, and so on. If it's .NET, then it has another structure and starting point, and they are completely different. Again, many initiatives decided to solve this issue by providing a way on how to package and ship your application to the end user. Probably the most famous is PhoneGap that also went one step forward and shipped this application to the mobile devices. But that wasn't enough, because if every one of those works independently, then we get the issue of lack of interoperability. I build an application for PhoneGap, and then I have a new customer that likes Adobe, for example, then I have to rebuild everything from scratches. And here comes the standard called Progressive Web App. How many of you heard about Progressive Web Apps? Interesting. OK. So Progressive Web App, I like to say that it's not a new framework. It's not a new programming language. I like to call it a checklist of items that if you follow, you get a standard Progressive Web App. And you can ship it to your customer. And remember my example? If the browser does not understand Progressive Web App, then it's not a browser. I couldn't say that maybe eight months ago when iOS didn't support progressive web apps yet. But now I have uh, full courage to go on stage and say, if a browser does not support a progressive web app, it's not a browser. Safari supports it. Firefox supports it. All the browsers support it as of today. Maybe Internet Explorer 11 has some issues. But we know that Internet Explorer 11 is uh, a browser as well. So how to, how to, uh, how to get a progressive web app? I summarize this into two easy steps. The first step is called the manifest file, which is basically the definition of your application. You need to define your application somehow, and that's a JSON file that you place in your root directory. It contains the app name, stand, uh, start, uh, start location, uh, logo, and so on. So this is how the browser is going to understand more about your application, and eventually, will be able to put it on the home screen and make it part of the app drawer of your mobile phone. And you add it in the head of your uh, HTML page, simply like that. Now to the second part, which is the service worker. I like to call it the installer of the web. It's a JavaScript file that you download and make it the center point of communication between whatever front end you have and whatever back end you have. So the service worker is very interesting because it allows you to go even one step forward by enabling you hardware access, enabling you background synchronization, push notifications, camera, location, geofencing, and all these kind of nice features. In the next few slides, I'm going to show you quickly an example code of how to write a service worker. So here I'm detecting uh, if service worker is available. You should not have this code anymore because we agree that all browsers should have service workers, but if you still want to support an Explorer 8 or something, then uh, after that, you just add an event listener to register your service worker. And here, my service worker is located in sw.js. 
and I, all I have to do is basically registering it. Now, inside SW.js, I have a listener, for example, for fetch. Here, what I'm doing is basically cache, cache the uh, pictures and CSS files into the browser cache. This is very helpful because it allows me that if I go offline, then I can eventually load the data from the cache instead of showing this little dinosaur, and uh, sorry, the application doesn't work. So this is a huge thing. It solves the reliability, reliability on the application and the lack of uh, work offline. So this is how I return the response of the cache. And another example is showing push. So here I'm defining the content of the push notification and then show notification with the title and the options that I have provided. And this is how it's going to look like. So this is a push notification that's going to appear, depending on your device, natively on the device. So if it's Windows, it's going to appear as a native Windows notification. If it's uh, iOS, then it's going to appear on the home screen as a native notification. Now, I didn't install any native application to be able to send this push. This is one of the reach that you can have nowadays with your web application. This is an example of an application. It's called Expand Manager. You can uh, Google it. It's open source. It shows you probably most of the features that you can have into a PWA. For example, when you open it for the first time, you can see that the Alvis bar appears because it appeared from a search engine. But if I visit this website enough number of times, then the browser will automatically ask me, it seems that you are interested. Do you want to add it inside your app drawer? This menu gonna, it has changed it actually. It's not home screen anymore. It's app drawer. Because if it's Android, it's gonna install it inside your Android. You can manage it and uninstall it later. And if it's iOS, then it's gonna be part of your iOS devices. Uh, and then you see that this little uh, red icon, it's the app itself. And now when I click on it, can you see the difference? There is no address bar anymore. Actually, if you go to processes, you will find that this is now a completely separate process, running completely standalone away from the browser. It's not part of the browser anymore. Now, the start point, let, let's put it in, in very, um, very systematic way. The start point is the reach. My user is going to reach me through web search. Now, after I have reached my user, I have acquired it because I provided a good user experience. That's the term progressively understanding the user. So progressively, I provided a good user experience so the user visited my website enough number of times. Now, the user like to add me on the home screen. At this point, I'm providing the best user experience by running an application fully fledged on the desktop. Later on, my user will open my application offline. It still works because I'm using Service Worker. So I have got all the capabilities of native applications without touching the App Store. Now, the last part is basically performance and hardware access. So uh, many people will tell me uh, about the performance and we don't like this hybrid model and these kind of things. Actually. The performance of browsers, we have seen that it has dramatically increased over the last two years at least. And the performance is no longer the issue. But there is still a bottleneck. For example, if you are developing a game or, or some, some sort of 3D engine. Luckily, now we have the so-called WebAssembly. So WebAssembly allows us to even cross this level and provide a native performance inside the browser. So this is the optimized part that, th that is the bottleneck of JavaScript engine because this is V8 JavaScript engine for Chrome. It tries to optimize the code if it's visited enough number of times. So we are avoiding all this tree and we are just going to the optimized code from the first shot. As I said, this is probably best bet for uh, game developers or for 3D developers and so on up until we get some extra level. And think about other APIs that you might be able to use inside the web nowadays. So WebVR, I believe there is a session tomorrow. Martin Spett, he's gonna do, talk about WebVR, uh, Bluetooth, proximity, uh, geofencing, and those kind of APIs. And remember my story in America, how I was struggling? 
The idea of progressive web apps is also getting rid of forms, going formless. So this kind of repetitive actions that even autocomplete is not enough. Because when you go to a form, registration form, and it shows you an autocomplete, you click, and sometimes you still have to go over the fields and validate that each single field is correct. And fields are not always in the same correct uh, order and the validation and all these kind of issues. Luckily, there is now the credential management and authentication APIs where you just, as a developer, you just ask the, the browser to log in with pre installed credentials inside my mobile phone. So remember the screen of Facebook and Google and login with an existing account? You no longer need to implement that yourself. You just ask the browser to provide this functionality for you. And the browser will provide the best user experience that appears on your smartphone, depending on what kind of phone you have. Same for payment request. So now you can just ask the browser to pop up a screen selecting the credit card information without having to implement any field to collect data or collect credit cards and those kind of things. So the recipe. It seems that web components, progressive web apps, WebAssembly, they add up to a native experience. It's not native apps. Native apps are still needed. I don't think I'm going to anytime soon manage my bank account through a native app, uh, a web app. I'm going to still have to use a native app. But in many cases, in many businesses, web native experience is way much needed. So a lot of things. I have talked a lot of, about a lot of things today. And I hope I didn't like bombard you with a lot of things to study. But I'll go quote Paul Lewis, who says that instead of worrying about the amount of things that you need to learn, uh, to be able to have this web native experience, probably focus on the platform. Instead of going and every single week you learn a new framework, probably the framework's gonna be bec gonna become a very thin layer that nobody cares about. And the only things that we need now is to just build web components. And we know that those web components are gonna be available throughout the frameworks. We build the basic functionalities, PWA, manifest file, those service worker, and then the framework is just going to be a matter of preference. Now, this all doesn't come alone because luckily we have tools that help you develop those things. You don't really have to write the code that I showed on screen from scratches. Like Polymer and Stencils that allows you to create web components. They are uh, very nice libraries that help you develop web components very quickly. Nevertheless, uh, many Famous frameworks now have this starter pack that allows you to create a progressive web app from scratches without having to uh, assign a manifest file and service worker. They just create and generate everything for you. And I recommend also Workbox, which is uh, a nice tool that allows you to manage caching and manage web APIs. Regarding WebAssembly, the good news is you no longer, you actually most likely not going to need to write WebAssembly yourself. WebAssembly is only left for people who want to convert their libraries, their native libraries, into assembly code to perform better. Like, for example, a game engine or 3D rendering engine. But for you, what you need to know is just how to link to a library written with WebAssembly. This is the browser support. Uh, those are the kind of uh, big companies that are adopting those high technologies. For example, YouTube recently has rewritten their whole website to be based on web components. And Twitter, the application that I'm using here, is not a native application. It's a PWA. It seems that the browser is slowly becoming the operating system. And we slowly can see that with only browser technologies, we uh, can uh, access it on multiple hardwares. It's just about building blocks that you place each other next to each other to build an application, and the framework is just a matter of detail. So probably we didn't uh, come up with uh, a flying cars, but we managed to get a drone, which is at this point quite, quite interesting. Drones are fun as well. And we are moving forward for even better. Now I have finished my talk, but a little bit about uh, myself. So I work for Vaden, uh, which is located in the North Pole, Finland, and the word Vaden, this t-shirt uh, comes from the reindeer, our uh, slogan, and 
uh, we develop everything free and open source web components. If you want to learn more about web components, you can go to valium.com slash start or pwa, valium.com slash pwa. Um, final thing, I want to give kudos to my colleague, Marcos, who helped a lot in this presentation and probably uh, gave a lot of resources and information. I think questions are going to be taken outside, and I'm going to have only five minutes. After that, I'm going to have a run. But other than that, thank you so much for listening. This is my Twitter. Please reach me.